be talking about optimal timing of type A intramural hematoma repair. Intramural hematoma was first described by Krukenberg in 1920 during post-mortem exam, in which he found a dissection without intimal tear. This was later adopted and widely accepted as the original term of IMH. However, the definition was later evolved into a hematoma confined within the medial layer of the aorta in the absence of detectable intimal tear. Although some believe that IMH represents an acute aortic dissection with thrombosis of the false lumen, and that an intimal tear is always present whether it's identified or not, Intramural hematoma is part of acute aortic syndromes. Acute aortic syndrome is a term used to describe a constellation of life-threatening aortic diseases that have similar presentations such as severe acute chest and back pain, but also have distinct demographic, clinical, and survival characteristics. Many classify acute aortic syndrome to three major entities. Number one is aortic dissection. Number two is intramural hematoma, and number three is penetrating aortic ulcer. And many reports have reported that intramural hematoma incidence is between 5 to 18 percent. There are several theories that exist regarding the mechanism of IMH, without really strong evidence to support each. And there is a debate whether IMH is the result of ruptured vas vasorum or thrombosed false lumen aortic dissection with undetected intimal defect, or combined. The classical theory, although lacking robust evidence, suggests that IMH is caused by rupture of vasovasorum in the media. This leads to separation of the medial bone layers, eventually causing a secondary tear or intimal defect in communication to the adventitial space. Again, strong evidence on this theory is lacking. Some studies have demonstrated that IMH have a small intimal communication discovered either at the time of surgery or more recently with high-resolution CT scans. Other studies examining the vasovasorum have suggested that hyperplasia leading to chronic occlusive disease within the aortic wall which triggers chronic medial ischemia and degeneration. And this medial ischemia often causes hematoma and dissection in the outer third of the media. However, further studies are needed to improve the understanding of the pathophysiology of intramural hematoma. Both aortic dissection and intramural hematoma patients can present with severe chest and back pain, however, IMH patients are older, more in females, and have less malperfusion, including cerebral, spinal, visceral, renal, or limb malperfusions. They also have less rupture, less aortic insufficiency, and more debakey type 2 and 3A. Diagnosis of acute type A IMH and other acute aortic syndromes relies on clinical presentation and imaging. There are no currently reliable biomarkers are available to provide an accurate diagnosis of any of these syndromes. EKG is usually obtained as part of the chest pain workup to rule out any coronary ischemia. CT and geography is the diagnostic imaging modality of choice in hemodynamically stable patients. It is highly sensitive and specific for identifying aortic pathology. If the CTA is non-diagnostic or equivocal, or the patient is hemodynamically unstable and needs to be rushed to the operating room, a transesophageal echocardiogram may be useful to confirm and support the diagnosis, and it is also very sensitive and highly specific. TEE can also identify any pericardial effusion or tamponade, any aortic valve regurgitation, or any wall motion abnormalities. However, complete imaging of the distal arch and the descending aorta is limited with this modality. And also, it is highly operator dependent. MRI can be used as well for diagnosis. 
Aortogram was the gold standard in the past, but it's rarely used nowadays with the um, era of CT angiogram. Intravascular ultrasound can also be used, and it's highly sensitive and specific. The main finding on CT angiogram in IMH is a crescent or circular shape high attenuation area along the aortic wall that does not enhance with contrast, as well as absence of an intimal flap and the absence of compression of a patent lumen. This is in contrast to classical aortic dissection, which radiographically appear with two distinct lumens. Although sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between aortic IMH and aortic dissection with complete thrombosis of the false lumen, as they appear similar. In this scenario, intravascular ultrasound may have a role. This is an intraoperative transesophageal echocardiogram image and shows regional thickening of the aortic wall. And again, it's in a crescent or circular shape thickening as indicated by the arrow. Now we come to management. Really a crucial aspect of management of those patients is to make sure that an early and accurate diagnosis is established so that the appropriate treatment can be instituted in a timely fashion. We treat acute type A IMH as any other acute aortic syndromes, as the initial management includes pain control and anti-impulse therapy, given the absence of hypotension, by controlling heart rate and blood pressure to minimize the likelihood of fracture or progression. These measures should be initiated immediately in the intensive care unit for all patients when the diagnosis has been established and should not interfere with the timely transfer to the operating room for those with the indications for immediate aortic repair. Beta blockers are usually used as blood pressure control agents, for example, Ismol or Lebitolone. These drips are initiated to maintain heart rate of less than 60 beat per minute and systolic blood pressure between 100 and 120 millimeter mercury, thereby decreasing stresses and minimizing lesion progression. Alternative agents, including calcium channel blockers or vasodilators, that should not be used without first controlling the heart rate with beta blockers since alone can reduce reflex activation of the sympathetic nervous system, leading to enhanced ventricular contraction and increased aortic stress. After initial stabilization of the patient, surgical management is usually sought. The management of acute type AI may remains controversial because it appears that pathology, risk of progression and outcomes to be dependent on ethnicities or geographic location and possibly other factors. Previous reports have demonstrated obvious differences between Asian and Western cohorts. The Asian series report a greater incidence of type A IMH and the patients are more frequently women at lower risk for progression to typical dissection with associated complications and have a lower mortality when managed medically. This is in contrast to many Western reports that maintained that type A IMH acts similarly to typical dissection and thus they recommend a more aggressive stance. The reason for these differences between geographic location or by ethnicity remain unclear. Although some have suggested that aggressive surveillance program may explain the higher incidence of IMH, in Asian cohorts. These are intraoperative pictures of acute and subacute type A intramural hematomas. We have slightly different timing regarding repair of type A intramural hematomas. Short delay in surgical intervention might allow the inflammation to subside, tissues to become more manageable, and facilitate subsequent repair. We usually repair those in two to three days, and they are usually stable acute type A intramural hematoma patients. Although delayed surgery conferred no advantages, yet recognizing that no early, being less than three days rupture, occurred when patients were clinically stable, this shows outcomes of repair of type A intramural hematoma as compared to classical aortic dissection. 
In our experience, overall 30-day mortality after aortic repair was 15%, without significant difference seen between acute type A intramural hematoma and typical acute type A aortic dissection patients. In conclusion, acute type A intramural hematoma continues to be associated with significant morbidity and mortality that is comparable to the classic aortic dissection, at least in Western cohorts. Delayed approach that is within 48 to 72 hours is the preferred approach in stable patients.